Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> uh, this one is for all panelists. Uh, do you anticipate a supply disruption for components and luminaires in the next 12 months? In which product segment and to what extent? Who would like to handle that first? Uh, this is Tom. I'll start with just the, uh, again, we do injection molded components for lighting fixtures. We've got uh, plants in Charleston, Michigan, Dixon, Tennessee, Monterey, Mexico, uh, the greater Atlanta area. And for the most part, we don't see any interruptions of supply for anything that's domestic. Uh, we are seeing some, uh, some issues that, uh, with our offshore components that we bring in, but not substantial. And uh, our biggest worry right now is that our, uh, you know, in the U.S., pretty much all the component and fixture manufacturers have been deemed essential. But uh, Mexico has put in a tighter restriction on what that means, and we are seeing shutdowns in Mexico. So, so far, our plant is open there, but uh, we're, if you will, on the bubble. Gotcha. As a follow-up, uh, I noticed that there are some other lighting manufacturers that have shut down in Mexico. Is it by region, or uh, do you have any sense of what's happening with manufacturing in Mexico as a whole? Well, uh, I think it's uh, inconsistent. We've, uh, there's, uh, I think it's in public uh, knowledge that uh, Cooper in Mexicali has been shut down. Uh, Cooper in Monterey is not shut down. Uh, Acuity in Monterey is down to medical components only or things that they can trace to that. So it's been spotty as to what is and isn't going to be allowed. Okay. I guess from the uh, LED component side and electronic side, I can say we're not anticipating any supply disruptions either. There are some issues getting PC boards because a vast majority of PC boards are made in China. Um, most of the factories are open and running at some level capacity. Um, the biggest issue that we're seeing right now is actually logistics with air freight flights being canceled, rerouted, delayed, things like that. So in general, we don't see a problem though. Great. Yeah, I think I, I would like to echo Corey's concerns. Uh, our, our team in um, Signify has been looking at this since probably January when the whole thing started in China. So they've kind of had their uh, pretty close track of where things are headed, what's slowing down, what's speeding up. And then they're trying to manage the pieces very well there. So for the most part, like Corey said, it's, it's more about the logistics than the actual supply. Great. Don, have you seen any disruptions on the manufacturing side? Um, not yet. It's kind of an evolving situation, though, uh, because domestically there are still a lot of areas that are on lockdown. But echoing the logistics issues, that's mostly what we're seeing uh, with components coming out of China is uh, because China was shut down for so long, there's all this pent up demand to fulfill existing orders. There's uh, a crush for existing boat space and plane space to get some of these components out of the country and and to the U.S. or wherever they're going. So we're seeing some long shipping delays and some uh, increasing costs to get things shipped out of China. So, but it's evolving. If, if the situation in, in Mexico continues to progress, you know, there's a, a fairly large number of component manufacturers in Mexico that would be affected by that and that could start affecting uh, stateside uh, fixture manufacturers for sure so and to your point don yeah we're seeing two to three times uh, normal shipping rates right now to, to get things over it's it's a, you're able to get things over but it's expensive so we i mean i it's certainly not my area of expertise uh being with ies we've heard some disruption similar to what you've mentioned about um, parts coming over from China. There's been some concern and mention of, you know, if there's a second wave, what does that, what does that do to um, sort of that, the value of the interim work that's being done. Um, I know Randy Reed at the Edison Report has been really uh, diligent in, in paying attention to this. So it might be good to keep an eye on uh, the Edison Report. Good call. Good call. Uh, Michael? All right, we're gonna head into the next question and we'll have Brianne lead off with the answer, but uh, 
after her information, if anybody else wants to chime in, we can do that as well. So the next question is going to be, what can you tell us about UV lighting as it relates to COVID-19? So we've been, the IES, we uh, have been sort of uh, kind of all hands on deck on that particular issue. But um, we did on April 17th, an email was sent to uh, IES members, I think, and non-members alike that describes current efforts from our photobiology committee. So on the IES website, you can actually just search for FAQ and it'll pop right up. Um, we published a, a list of frequently asked questions about UV lighting. So the 10,000 foot view is that there is a specific range of UV lighting referred to as UVC um, that has proven effective in, in um, Oh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but it's proven effective for um, the SARS uh, CoV-2 virus, so COVID-19. Um, it's interesting though, because there's a lot of misnomers out there about UV lighting in general, especially on the residential side. So this, the report put together by the photobiology committee is amazing. There's just, there's everything you can possibly want to know. And again, if you want to see it and you didn't get the email, you can go to the IES website type in FAQ and it'll pop right up. Um, but essentially, you know, UV lighting is a, a range outside the visible light spectrum, um, 100 nanometers to 400, I have to always write it down, 400 nanometers. Um, the most effective range or the, the UVC range that they keep referring to is a little bit more limited. There's UVA, UVB, and UVC. <clears throat> UVC is in the 200 to 280 range. There are products that have, um, had some had success in that range, uh, a couple different reports on which nanometer range, but you can read the report. And I think what's important for now is that we know it's a possibility to use UV lighting for to reduce transmission, um, but there's sort of the operation maintenance and education standpoint that we have to pay really close attention to, right? So it's great to have new information, but on the other hand, between operations, uh, in, in other words, what somebody's comfortable with and maintenance over time and the education about UV lighting and what it can do to human skin and that kind of thing. There's so much to know that I, I would highly recommend not, not nobody jump right in, but um, the photobiology committee does a much better job uh, than I can, but they have used it for upper air uh, or upper room um, disinfection. So that's seven feet above the floor and above, uh, sort of a consistent air disinfection. So, um, and I see there's a question come in that says, did I understand Brian to say UVC has been tested on COVID-19 and that is correct, yes it has. And so I, I highly recommend the report. People much smarter than me are working on this and um, it's great to see the CDC and some other information being pulled into one area. And so there's also a video um, on the IES website, it's free to watch, that is an introduction to this type of lighting in case you are unfamiliar. So we'll see where it goes. Uh, one could be helpful. There's a, the University of Michigan and Beaumont hospitals here in Michigan did release um, a statement that they were using UV lighting for some of their N95 masks. To what end and to how effective, uh, they didn't say. But it's interesting that people are trying. As a follow-up question, is there any um, uh, inherent um, issues with using this type of lighting without a lot more study to be done on it? Um, you know, is there? So I think um, the human exposure part, I can't emphasize enough that that, that has to be um, considered, but I think the photobiology committee does a really good job of saying, here's where it's shown effective, here's where we are now, and here's where we could go from here. There's been a lot of research about this for the last few years, right? Obviously in this, in our current climate, um, the research has been ramping up specifically for this virus, but there's been an, enough research, I think, and enough trial and error that we've come to some, some confidence in the initial stages. There are manufacturers who know, again, way more than I do, who can, um, help answer those questions, but the photobiology committee did a great job explaining even um, the depths of the nanometer range and what's effective for what and that kind of thing. So bacteria 
um, too. So there's quite a bit of information. It's hard to summarize, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> in like kind of a, a 10,000 foot view, but um, it's still a really exciting place to be if it helps. Yeah, the other area that's got, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, the other area that's got a lot of interest is the 405 nanometer space as well. And uh, there's a few licenses. There's some IP from University of Strathclyde in uh, out of Glasgow, Scotland. A few licensees in the North American uh, market, you know, namely Hubble and Kennel, that are using those. And they perfected, in a lot of ways, the dosage, the, the intensity, as well as the time. So a lot of interest in 405 nanometer as well, but I will again, caution, be careful about the IP <laughs> if you do proceed down that path. Um, yeah, I just want to comment if I could real quickly, we're working with a, a company that makes the one of the air purifying versions of that where it's it circulates the air into the fixture and then purifies it with UVC. And they also make devices that decontaminate uh, devices. So those would be perhaps um, fixed or something else, but clearly, you don't want to be in an environment that's got UVC in it. It's, it's, you know, it's uh, way worse than a tanning bed. So you wouldn't want to be in an environment that's being constantly bombarded with UVC, even at relatively low levels, uh, the dosage would be really bad. So it's going to be a situation where I think it's going to go either purify a room that nobody's in or make it so that nobody is exposed to the UVC while it's being uh, turned on. Right, and the, the, there, are, there is a distinct difference between whether you're using it for air versus surfaces. So that's another distinction that's important to, to sort of um, get more information about. Um, I do see a follow-up question about the specific video. So yes, the video is called Introduction to Ultraviolet and Visible Radiation Disinfection. Um, it is uh, David Sliney and Richard Vincent. They uh, put that together for us. David Sliney is the um, committee chair for the photobiology committee. Um, again, it's free on the IES website, so uh, you can check it out there. Gotcha. Um, Don, a, a question came in that uh, is, is, are you, as Lumicon, looking at anything in that space? Uh, looking at it, yes. Uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, we're seeing if, if there's something that can be done or, or, you know, somehow that Lumicon could make a product that would contribute. But, uh, you know, we're, we're learning as much as we can about this. And um, like Brianne mentioned, it's, uh, it's early. And if you're not already in this space, you got to proceed with caution because, um, you know, UV light is not UV light. What what uh, UVA works for, you know, UVC might not work for and vice versa. So you develop a product that is, let's say 400 nanometers and that might address some of the uh, bacterial contaminants or germs or, or um, whatnot. And that's not gonna work for COVID-19. So you have to be very focused on what you're developing and, and how you're gonna go to market with it. We're, you know, we're looking at, at options, but uh, you know, nothing's set in stone yet. Uh, right now, I think because there, there are a lot of companies doing the similar, taking a similar path, or they want to jump in and, and develop a product that can disinfect uh, specifically for COVID-19. But right now we're in this phase of, of uh, managing information and, and trying to educate people as much as we can on, on what's right, right and what's wrong. You know, some people see products, hey, you can you can work under this light and get disinfected while you work. And um, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, yes, you'll get quickly disinfected if you work under a UVC light, but uh, the long-term effects could be pretty hazardous. So that's kind of the phase that we're in right now um, as far as uh, UV lighting goes. Gotcha, gotcha. Does anybody else have anything to add? Okay, uh, this one, uh, back to you, Don. Uh, commercial LED fixtures have been on the market for well over a decade now. Are there any long-term quality patterns, issues emerging? In other words, what is the weak link of an LED fixture? Well, uh, that's kind of, uh, I could break that up into two parts. By far, by, by a wide margin, 
uh, the cause. Be careful of, how you answer here, by the way. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully because I, I have an LED guy and a power supply guy on the line right. here. So, yeah. Um, uh, the cause by far of, of most of the failures that we see coming back from the field are due to existing power issues at the site, at the, at the uh, uh, install site for the lighting. Um, a lot of times when these projects are, are uh, funded, you know, you're funding energy savings, you're not funding infrastructure upgrades. Uh, you know, you need the ROI on your investment. And so uh, they pay for the lighting without any regard to the infrastructure. And, and quite honestly, when you're flipping from traditional lighting technologies to LED, uh, LED is, a, is an electronic component. It's a lot more sensitive to infrastructure issues than the old lighting technologies were. So a lot of times, uh, property owners or end users may not even know that they have infrastructure issues on their site. So things like bad wiring, bad grounding, uh, power surges, if you've got uh, heavy equipment cycling on the, on the lighting circuit, that's going to create surges and that's all damaging to the LED fixtures. Uh, we put surge suppressors in all of our fixtures to try to mitigate some of that, but really it's a band-aid uh, for a much larger problem that should probably be addressed. So that's from the cause side, that's most of what we see is caused by surges. Um, to the individual LED fixture, uh, the so-called weak link in the chain is, uh, is still the power supply. Uh, most power supplies uh, have electrolytic capacitors in them. It is, if you think of it as, as like a consumable, it does get used up over time. That electrolyte uh, basically cooks out of there. Um, so if you can keep the temperature of the driver down to a minimum, uh, that capacitor will live a lot longer and you can get uh, some pretty long lifetimes out of those drivers, but that is still uh, the weak link that we see um, our, our blown drivers. There's, you know, you could get uh, drivers that don't have electrolytic capacitors in them. They could have uh, you know, ceramic capacitors or other styles in them that will last them a lot longer. Those are a lot more expensive though too. So you have to balance uh, your you know, total cost of your bill of materials with um, you know, the lifetime of the fixture. So. Yeah. Does anybody want to add in on that? Yeah, cool, cool. maybe. Uh, no, I, I agree with most of what Don said. I think it, it, the power quality and the existing infrastructure, lighting power infrastructure is ex extremely critical uh, in terms of determining what's going to happen. Um, and, and of course, with LED lighting, right? You, the first time you have a, power, a light source that actually outlasts the driving electronics. So automatically, the focus kind of shifts to, hey, why is my driver failing? My LEDs are still still lit or, or working. Um, so I think uh, you pointed to some good good examples uh, from the power quality side. Electrolytics, we've actually never really seen a wear out failure emerging from an electrolytic drying out. So I think even, even though, yes, techno technologically, electrolytics tend to become the weak link, but you're absolutely correct that heat is the major issue. And heat is not only affecting the electrolytic, but it's also affecting all the other components. So uh, just maybe to add to your answer there. Yeah. And then the last thing I could add as well is that when we do get a fixture back from the field that's been in there for a number of years, it, it, it's, it's not very common, but when we do get it back, 75 to 80% of the failures are EOS related. So to your point, surge is really the, the issue. So the existing infrastructure not being upgraded along with the fixtures to you know, echo what Don and align with what Don said. There's a follow-up question. I think Corey, you could answer this too. And that is that um, as far as the quality of the LEDs that are being used, would you like to speak to the fact that there's uh, varying ranges in quality of actual LEDs themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's a kind of a tough one to, uh, <laughs> to address, but, um, yes, you definitely want to stick with a, with a brand name LED. There are, are counterfeits out there. There's also quite a few, um, tier two suppliers, tier three suppliers that may have a little bit of dubious quality out there. So, as long as you stick with a with a well-known name brand in general everybody everybody's leds have a a good amount of quality and a good amount of life 
on the I think uh, on top of that, I think it's important for fixture manufacturers to, to choose an LED that's meant for the application that it's being used in. You know, there's, there's LEDs that I think perform really well in, in, a, in a lamp application, uh, a screw-in lamp application that maybe you wouldn't want to put in a street light. Um, so, you know, when you're absolutely, you want to look at name brand LEDs, but you want to line it up for what its design intent was as well, you know, to get the maximum performance and lifetime out of it. Yeah, very true. Don, to add to your manufacturer responsibility, um, it's interesting to me that we tend to look at lifetime from a TM21 perspective or a, a emitter um, perspective, and it's really common for manufacturers to post um, how long their LEDs will last in, in perfect conditions, um, sort of removed from the entire system, right? People use those lifetime numbers that you see of 200,000 hours or whatever, and you still mine, see it. Mine all say 400,000 hours, so uh, we're going to, you know, win that. Race. Good, you got my report. Yeah, okay. cool. <laughs> um, so without a driver, they might just last that long. But um, so it's, it's actually really uh, great to hear some consensus about kind of the fact that the, the focus could maybe shift a little from from those outrageous numbers that if uh, it was perfect condition, LED would last. Great. Uh, all right, Michael, over to you. Thanks. All right, we're going to go to the next question. Uh, we're going to direct this over to Maya. Uh, and of course, again, everyone can uh, add afterwards. But the question is, what role do LED drivers play within the Internet of Things space? And what makes them appealing to be used in connected applications? Maya? Yeah, perfect. Uh, that's, that's a great, great question. Um, I, I think what's happening now with uh, technology, right, where there's this perfect um, gathering of sensors, lower cost sensors, um, and, and it's, it's kind of the right time to have more intelligent intelligence built into the driving electronics. And, and there's certain things that drivers basically are well positioned to do, for example, energy monitoring. So they're extremely well positioned to give you a very accurate readout of the energy consumed by the system. They also can give out kind of piggybacking on the previous question, right? Hey, what's happening inside the driver? Is the driver wearing out? So some kind of predictive maintenance type of indications that, hey, yeah, we actually see the efficiency drop in the driver. Could that be you know, leading to a failure, um, it will not be very good at predicting EOS type of in, in, incidents that are um, occasional, but it could lead to more insights on how the driver is being used over a, pro, a broader range of uh, life. And, and that could give us uh, quite good insights. So th that, that's a huge role where LED drivers play. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on the panel have something to add to that? Okay, great. We'll move on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> this one's directed to Corey. Corey, what is the difference between discrete LEDs and chip on board LEDs? Are there any benefits uh, of one over the other? Which one is better for outdoor applications? Kind of what uh, to echo what Don said is like make sure you use the right LED for the right application, and you can use discrete LEDs as well as COB LEDs for for outdoor applications. So both are fine. There's just different uh, advantages and disadvantages between the two. So in a, uh, a discrete LED is in a small device down to maybe 1.5 by 1.5 millimeters and they can dissipate a watt or two up to a COB or the, the fried egg type devices that, uh, that you're familiar with that can actually dissipate up to 80 watts. So, um, you know, that's drastically different. The, the, if, I like to use an example. For example, if I wanted to develop a 10,000 lumen fixture at 150 lumens per watt, the COB pricing may be slightly lower uh, from a pure LED standpoint than a discrete standpoint. However, the biggest issue with that COB is if you have an 80 watt COB, you have a lot of power in a very small area to dissipate, and that can be very tricky. Um, uh, in the, I think most of those issues have been addressed now, but in the early days of the COBs is that they didn't take into account dissipating the, the, 
the power efficiently, efficiently, excuse me. And there were some failures out in the field, but in general, uh, I think that's gotten better. Um, the other advantage is the spot size can be smaller. So from an optical standpoint, a COB may be advantageous, uh, especially like in a track light or a down light. In a, um, in, a, in a outdoor light, maybe not as much of an advantage. Um, the other advantage of a COB is it's more of an off the shelf type of component. So it's a lot easier to get into the fixture business or the lighting business with a COB. There are many off the shelf components, holders, optics, things like that, that don't uh, require a heck of a lot of engineering investment to be able to develop a fixture around that, around a COB, excuse me. Does that answer the question you think? Uh, yeah, Don, is there anything you want to add on that at all? Um, you know, I, I would just say that, um, you know, traditionally we've always looked at LED choice in terms of uh, thermal density as well. Um, you know, especially as Corey mentioned in the early days, the COBs because of the thermal density maybe had a little shorter lifetime expectancy and that's probably still true. Um, so, you know, if you're developing a product that's going to have, you know, uh, a longer than normal warranty to it, uh, we, we would certainly look at stuff like that. And that's why we've tended to use discrete LEDs versus COBs in our products. But, you know, there's plenty of applications out there where COBs make a lot of sense. You know, um, <clears throat> if you're doing lower wattage uh, products, you know, I'd say 25 watts or less, uh, Bollard or a wall pack or something like that. And, a COB from a manufacturing standpoint makes a lot of sense because there's less components, uh, less labor involved in assembling a fixture with a COB than there is with discrete LEDs or getting a PCB made with discrete LEDs. So um, I think it just comes down to uh, philosophically what you're trying to do as a company and what kind of warranty you're going to support and, um, and uh, what type of a product you're developing uh, drives that LED choice. Gotcha. All right, Michael. Okay. This next question is going to go over to Tom Barnes. Uh, Tom, how important is glare and what is the best way to combat it? Thank you, Michael. And thanks guys for allowing me the last 23 minutes to be discussing nothing but glare because this is my soapbox issue. So I'm just <laughs> going on about this. <clears throat> I see what Corey mentioned. Uh, there with the COBs is a really good example of what's going on with glare. I think uh, we live in a world right now where energy savings and cost of fixtures seems to drive a lot of buying decisions and not so much quality of light. <clears throat> we all experience glare when uh, glare is there's really negative lighting. It's attractive from your ability to see. Just like oncoming headlights are are putting out light there, but they're not doing anything to help you see what's going on. Glare is, glare is uh, reducing your ability to see the tasks that you're, you're supposed to be doing. Um, so for outdoor lighting, uh, you know, you can imagine, as you talked about there, Corey, with the intensity of a COB, uh, that if you're trying to light a general area that people are going to be in, your task is to enlarge that source again and make it as big as you can um, before it's out of the fixture. So refractors, reflectors, diffusers, or things like that are going to be needed to make that kind of thing happen um, and, and do it with some comfort and then do it with control. And this is my, my pitch here for Lumicon. Uh, I don't know if, if Don says something, then his picture will pop back up. But he's got ring of fires on behind him there in the, uh, on the wall. And uh, yeah, there you <laughs> right there. And, uh, and great example, but uh, you've got... Uh, a lot of what Lumicon has done in outdoor lighting has been large optics that, uh, that really give you a, a, a larger, you know, the same amount of light being emitted over a larger area is less glare. So outdoor lighting, that's a, that is what we want to have done is increase the source size and limit the intensity. <clears throat> the, uh, on, the, on the indoor side of it, it's, it's uh, equally frustrating that um, we see high bays that for generations now, We've seen a typical high bay is sold. It's got a reflector on it. It's the, the reflector there is to help direct the light and to cut down the high angle glare. And about only about 15% of high bays these days are being sold with any kind of optical control device on them. And if you if you take a, a 
a brightness meter there and take a look at that. Uh, we, we had LEDs up next to our old HIDs. Um, a bare HID at, at a normal viewing angle has actually less glare than an, than an LED. So I see a lot of uh, people making the choice to go cheap and, and go without the uh, glare control instead of uh, making a good buying decision there. So, so it's good to see the options out there where you can provide good optics. Thank you, Tom. I know that, uh, of course, this issue is also certainly discussed um, pretty heavily at the Street and Area Lighting Conference in Austin, Texas, about a year and a half ago. And so uh, with that, Brian, with your involvement with the IES, I want to see what uh, kind of issues have come across as far as your experience. So there's been, there was actually a, um, a discussion about it too at the DOE conference this year. Glare seems to be um, a consistent discussion for all of us for the last several years. Thankfully so. Uh, Naomi Miller's done a lot of really good work from PNNL on uh, glare and its effects. So has, um, I know Muscle Lighting's been involved and um, a few others. So there's a, uh, there are additional efforts being worked on. One of the goals for a future, you know, IES annual conference will be actually a a demonstration of what all that feels like, um, but more more intensely, so that or more immersively than we've done so in the past, so that people really to sort of drive the point home. Um, but I, I, Tom, I'm glad you mentioned uh, high base specifically because those environments, you know, with three shifts of people and and everything that they represent, right? The work quality. I mean the quality of life while you're at work in those environments when you're under a high bay is already kind of, um, you know, there might be physical risk where there's, you're standing on concrete all day. I mean, the least we could do is, is uh, work on the lighting a little bit. Um, I know some people have worked on, and I know I'm getting a little bit away from Michael, what you asked, but I think it's important to note that we, we struggle so much with uniformity or, or not uniformity, but contrast. Uh, so we have disability glare and there's, discomfort glare but there's also I think some responsibility of learning more about like painting your ceilings white and having up light and doing some things to mitigate the idea that yes your direct line of sight it can be um egregious but so can that 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 intensity which you're just like you were saying Tom without any kind of optics on a fixture you see those bare LEDs and it's just brutal to look at um so I'm I'm hoping we Man, I really wish we were past this. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it. I wish we were past this. I think there's enough research about it. We understand it. We know what it's like to feel light entering our eyes. Headlights are a great example. I know that was talked about earlier. So, I mean, I'd like to see us past this. I, I know one of the automotive manufacturers in Detroit, um, one of the big three, as we call them, uh, they require a three percent uplight. Uh, three to five percent uplight in their specs so that at least you that cave effect goes away a little bit but I think it's a holistic application application by application discussion that has to happen I don't think a one-size-fits-all works but. Yeah. and I agree with that Brian as far as you know wanting to get to the point where we're past that everyone understands and I think it's inevitability but in you know as we've moved into LED adoption a lot of times decision makers are just simply looking at the bottom line and awesome, yeah. totally devoid from the experience of being under direct glare. Um, but I think it's, you know, one of the reasons, again, why it was so prominent at, uh, in discussion in Austin a year and a half ago is that, um, you know, as everyone's looking solely at efficacy, uh, lo and behold, there's a lot more involved with lighting than just luminous profile. Right. Well, I'm afraid that cost, we're going to head into another phase of cost being a motive for, for, um, uh, that's a timely point. Yep. Um, cost will be, I think, a driving factor now. It's it's interesting because as the economic climate does this, our, our focuses seem to seem to follow suit. Um, there's an interesting organization, Vision Zero Network, um, that talks a little bit about um, uh, managing safety, vehicular safety, and things like that. So hopefully, you know, programs like that with lighting will start to work on things like street lighting and area lighting. In the outdoor space. Uh, to that extent, uh, I want to direct over to Tom Barnes. And Tom, if you could take your hat off for a second as a lighting expert and put it on as a production, uh, you know, 
a facility manager, if you will, um, what's the benefit, you know, if we talk about costs, how much more productivity can you get out of your workforce if they're living and breathing in a well-lit, low glare environment? You know, we've, we run three manufacturing, four manufacturing operations and, uh, and all of them, I would say, are well lit. You know, we certainly emphasize, we're a lighting company, so we emphasize making sure that we've done a good job with that. <clears throat> and back when I was on the office lighting committee and the industrial lighting committee, I think one of, the, one of the things that we always struggled with was nobody had really done a great job yet of qualifying the value of that. Some of the numbers you'd see that were thrown out there were unbelievably high. <laughs> you know, you'd, you'd, you'd look at this and go, okay, well, I probably can't convince everybody that you get three times the output of, uh, you know, uh, of people by making their work environment more, uh, more pleasant. But uh, I think we do live in an environment where employment is competitive. You know, where do I want to work? What kind of a place do I want to work in? And <clears throat> my daughter works in one of those places that's got a beer keg um, going in the, you know, in the office. And uh, we're doing a lot of things to go ahead and make it a, a more comfortable environment for our employees. I think when somebody walks into one of our facilities and goes in a plant and they see, oh, it's clean, it's neat, it's really well lit, you're not shielding your eyes when you walk in, it doesn't look like a cave. I think that's our benefit that we can provide as a, a soft metric that this is a more pleasant place to work. Tom, there's an interesting survey going around from HGA, the architecture firm, about people who work from home and what they like most about it. And I love, I took the survey and um, one of the questions was, do you prefer working from home? I'm going to uh, narrow it down rather than trying to repeat the entire question, but essentially is one of the benefits working from home that you can control your own lighting. And I'm curious and temperature, so don't, you know, um, there's other factors, right? But I'm, I can't wait for them to publish that because now that we all work from home and we have a different perception of what's comfortable um, because we're now responsible for it. I'm curious to see what the next step is in, well, when I worked from home, really diffuse lighting near my computer worked. Or when I worked from home, I'm, I'm just wondering how much personal responsibility or accountability we're now gonna have to advocate for different things in the workplace. It, I'll be curious to see what HGA kind of comes up with but I loved loved they asked that question because maybe not that it goes specifically to a percentage of a productivity gain but maybe we'll learn a little bit more about people and lighting from it that's an excellent point after we have a couple of months everybody having their own hand on the toggle of the light control how that's yeah. going to come back when they go to the office yeah or maybe there'll be marriage counseling about it I don't know but I think everybody has their different <laughs> preferences for sure so yeah Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, there is a question that popped up. Uh, and I want to let the person know it's about CRI. We are actually going to get to that in not this next question, but the question after. So if they can sit tight, we're probably going to answer that question in full. So, uh, but I will um, just to let that person know we're not ignoring them. Um, so the next question, this is to all panelists. And this is kind of a hot button question. Um, so I'm going to post it up here, but, uh, most critical components are currently made in Asia. Will the lighting industry bring manufacturing back to the U S and now let me add on to that for a second too. And that obviously during this pandemic, one of the things that we found out was that a lot of pharmaceuticals are being made abroad. And obviously there was kind of an uproar about that too. And so, um, so when, when things like this happen, it kind of exposes the supply chain and, uh, and where everything's coming from. So if anybody wants to elaborate on that, please do. I'll jump in. Um, I, I really don't see a lot of the supply chain relocating from Asia anytime soon. Uh, Fixture manufacturers, uh, I think most of them always have had at least some capacity, the major ones, some capacity to assemble in the U.S. I don't see that changing anytime soon, but, you know, moving most of these component manufacturing operations from Asia to someplace closer to home or closer to the U.S., maybe uh, moving them back to the U.S., I just don't ever see that happening. Um, I was reading, I think it was a maybe a 
global economic uh, forum or something online and they were talking about the average cost of manufacturing in China versus other places in the world right now. And it's actually got it, gotten less expensive to manufacture in Mexico than it has in China just due to increasing labor rates and, and whatnot in China. So companies are looking at relocating, not necessarily because of this pandemic or, or any other concern like that, but just due to economic reasons, financial reasons, uh, opening plants and facilities in places like Vietnam and Thailand, uh, where the labor rates are lower, uh, the skill sets are also lower. So you have to uh, weigh that into the, uh, into the factor as well. Um, or, you know, building plants in Mexico or expanding existing plants in Mexico, just because you know, the costs are increasing in China. There are lo logistical issues with, uh, you know, ordering components or, or full fixtures in China. There's a, a lead time that you have to deal with and a transport cost and tariffs and there's all kinds of things. But as far as wholesale moving everything to the U.S. and manuf manufacturing here, uh, I don't think most shareholders of publicly traded manufacturers would be too happy with that strategy. So I, don't, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a few comments. So, and, and I agree with Don. I think, you know, we've seen the same thing that Mexico has become the new China, if you will. Costs went up in China. Costs are stable in Mexico, but the, the dollar has strengthened versus the <clears throat> versus the peso. So we're, um, we see a lot of activity there. We see, uh, we've seen a lot of our growth in the last couple of years come from U.S. fixture manufacturers moving production from China back to North America. And again, most of that's been in into Mexico, not into the US per se. <clears throat> um, I think the biggest area of that is in fixtures that need to be configured here. So if you're gonna buy a two by two lay-in panel, nobody wants to build those in North America because they're ubiquitous. You, you don't have any real iterations to them. Uh, so, so those kind of things, complete finished commodity, if you will, fixtures are going to probably continue to come in from Asia. But we've seen things that need to be configured like you're doing roadway lighting and you've got to type two, three, four, and five all coming out of the same fixture body, but you got to decide at the end there which version you're doing the, uh, to try and bring in those, all of those fixtures and stock the inventory to satisfy that just doesn't work logistically or cost-wise. So those are the kind of things we're seeing here. And I, I see that as being the protection to the U.S. industry. A lot of the outdoor lighting that gets configured late in its, uh, its decision-making pro process, those are things that are good, good and stable for the, for the U.S. market and perhaps even grow here. Um, Don, back to you for a second. Uh, a, a lot of the products that you've worked with and designed at Lumicon are are actually being made in the United States. What led you to that? And what are the drawbacks and what are the positives of that? Um, yeah, so we, we source as much as we can domestically. I mean, there's, there's things like power supplies and LEDs that are gonna come from where they come from. There's not much you can do about that. Um, our focus has been more on quality and robustness of engineering. Um, you know, we're starting to shift uh, supply base for uh, die castings to the US just because the advantage of die casting in China has almost completely dried up, at least from our standpoint. There's no cost advantage anymore. Um, and you certainly have less control over your supply chain if you're casting things in China. So um, the other advantage is if we, let's say we're, we're uh, building a wall pack, um, if we're ordering those die castings from China, we have to fill it an entire container with castings to get it here. That's just the way things work. So I have to wear, now I would have to warehouse thousands of castings here uh, that I may not need for uh, several weeks or several months. Whereas if I'm sourcing locally, you know, I can order 200 castings from our plant in Muskegon and they'll be here in a week or two. And, um, you know, as, as far as logistics goes and cash flow, uh, that's far preferable to whatever small cost savings I would have had in China, which quickly gets chewed up in these shipping costs, and especially now with the tariffs. Uh, that's why I'm saying there's, 
you know, the advantage is almost dried up for sourcing a lot of this stuff in China. But again, things like LEDs, uh, you know, they're all pretty much manufactured in China. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but uh, most of them come from China. Uh, same with power supplies. There's uh, some manufacturers that are uh, that have a huge footprint in Mexico as far as manufacturing power supplies, and we, we utilize a, a ton of those. And um, and other manufacturers are are again refocusing some of their plant capacity in Mexico for that reason. So um, I think the closer to home it is, the easier it is to manage. Honestly. Further to uh, Don's point about the LED components, yeah, a lot of them are made in China, um, but at Samsung, we are taking some of our higher value added components, our higher value components, and moving those to other manufacturing locations, including Korea and Vietnam. That was initially motivated to avoid tariffs, but now with the with the uh, with the latest situation, that's been accelerated. Also, we're, we've moved most of our module production from China. So, basically, you know, putting LEDs on PC boards, we've moved most of that out of China into uh, Vietnam or Korea to again avoid tariffs. But unfortunately, that kind of stuff is not going to come back to the U.S. or North America anywhere. And Corey, can I ask you? I mean. Um, what's the number one reason why it wouldn't come back to the U.S.? Uh, just the infrastructure isn't set up. There's not, you know, there's not the semiconductor in, uh, infrastructure for LED manufacturing just isn't here in North America anymore. And the capital investment is, is massive to do that. Um, so I, I just don't see it happening, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Anyone else? We're good. All right, Michael, to you. Okay, uh, we're getting close on our time. This will probably be the last question. Um, I'm gonna direct this to Brienne, and I know that Corey had actually touched on it with us a couple weeks ago previously. Question is, what can you tell us about TM30 adoption in specifications, uh, latest news for development, et cetera, and will it ever really replace CRI? Two parts to that is, do I need to run an additional test, and how do I get this info? Brienne? So the 10,000 foot view of all that is if you have an SPD file, uh, spectral power distribution, no, you don't run a separate test for TM30. You take your SPD file that informs your TM30 values. Um, it, it It's in an interesting stage right now where the newest TM30 um, update from that committee has, has included uh, Annex E is what we call it. Uh, Annex E has some recommendations for different specification things. So sort of we're finally getting into a place of, okay, this is uh, something that people are being educated about, but need a little bit more rules. People love numbers and a very specific uh, goal to shoot for. So um, the latest iteration of TM30 gave us that uh, depending on sort of your expertise level, you could lean on what's coming out of that committee instead of kind of making a determination for yourself. I mean, I personally think color for the most part is so subjective that any high um, color fidelity kind of environment, you should uh, be doing a mock-up or looking at the, the luminaire if you can. Um, the CIE uh, has embraced the RF part of TM30. And so now it's considered a global standard, that part of it. RG, there's, um, has not, been uh, sort of approved or embraced by the CIE yet. So we're kind of in a place where we've gotten RF, which is the most similar to CRI embraced, but um, RG is not there yet. So it's uh, it's the most, uh, well, one of the most sought after things that we have. So on our e-learning portal, people seem to be seeking out color all the time. Uh, it's amazing to me that that seems to be our one of our most popular courses is anything on TM30. So I think people see the value, um, but in terms of adoption, more manufacturers are going to have to make it readily available in order for people to really grab a hold of it. It'll have to show up on spec sheets. It'll have to, I mean, well building um, still allows you to pursue CRI as an alternative CRI or TM30. So until lead or well or somebody forces everybody to to focus on it i think cris are around for a while longer for sure yeah in a moment i'll ask Corey to chime in but if you would just clarify for some of the audience that isn't aware of rf and rg 
of what that means. Right. So RF is a um, is essentially an average fidelity kind of deviation. So you have what you'd consider perfect. Uh, RF is an average of the entire spectrum, how, cl how far away it is from perfect. What it didn't tell us is which colors are affected and to what extent. And so RG gives us a little bit more information in terms of um, whether we've got a green heavy luminaire or a, a blue heavy luminaire. I mean, there's uh, some of the spectrum components are available in RG, but again, it's still an average. So there's an additional third metric that people have used, which is the chroma shift in Huben one. Uh, and I don't want to get into the details of that, but essentially it's very similar to R9. So we had CRI as an average of eight colors and R9, which is the ninth color, which is saturated red, was sort of the, the um, additional request on top of that to maintain fidelity in the red spectrum. Um, TM30 has a similar model where red can be kind of honed in on since it's so important to our preferences. Great, thank you. Corey, anything to add to that? Um, as I mentioned uh, on the call a few weeks ago that the vast majority, I, I don't want to say 100%, but almost 100% of my discussions with luminary manufacturers is on CRI. Um, we do have the SPD files available. If customers do want to do the TM30 calculations, we can provide that. But again, it's mostly CRI. And there is a general renewed interest, I say, in higher CRI LEDs, 90 CRI and even 95 plus CRI LEDs over the last, over the last few months. Um, there's a, there was a question that came up um, and I'll address this to uh, We'll start off with Bree and Michael, but uh, uh, bear with me. Um, CRI has its place in LED lighting world for many good reasons. But when compared to interior versus exterior, where interior often sees 90 plus CRI specs, is there a law of diminishing return for exterior solutions, applications? When CRI is boosted to the same as interior, 90 CRI, 95 CRI, question mark, at some point, does CRI contradict the general efficiency of an exterior LED built at, say, 80 CRI or less? Or will the LED chip continue to boost and combat the same outputs lost when jumping up into the 90 CRI, et cetera? That was a lot. But yes, it was. Um, it's, a, it's a perfectly valid question, first of all. Um, CRI has its uh, major limitations. And, you know, I'll say in the outdoor space, the one thing that I really appreciate about TM30 in particular is that you could actually look at the colors that are most prominent in an outdoor space. So you could actually focus more on the greens and browns and things like that. Um, so it's interesting because CRI is this average, but the amount of colors that we see outside at night are uh, not something that we, or the type of color we see is not something we take into consideration. But the briefest answer I can think of is that, yes, I'm sure there's a point of diminishing return. I'm not an expert in what that is. Most outdoor um, specification requirements that I saw as a designer was 80 CRI or higher in the outdoor environment, um, which is pretty high, actually, uh, at the time that it was being required because, you know, people were used to much lower than that. Um, I would not go, I would not have gone out of my way to spec a 90 or 95 CRI in the outdoor environment, probably. Um, because the, I, but the diminishing return there for me would be cost, not, not, um, not energy efficiency, which I can't say that that's the best answer, but it would be mine. I think there's some federal standards that require 85 CRI exterior. And I don't think any LED company bins to 85 CRI, so you have to jump up to 90 CRI. I think that's probably maybe what's driving that question. So uh, you do. Yeah, that's a good point. You do uh, take a hit for performance when you run up to 90 CRI for sure. Uh, you're going to be maybe 10 or 15 less e uh, percent less efficient when you run up to 90 CRI. And I think the probably the bigger question is. Is it even necessary? I mean, if you're doing security lighting or something like that, or whether you have security cameras, 
it makes total sense. Maybe that's what's driving the federal spec. But well, that's... but they've got conversely better too, right? I mean, as, as LED gets better, so do they. So yeah. that blue, was a blue car, black car, green car was always a big like conversation. But I have to ask, and Don, maybe it's a good question for you. If you were in a parking lot of 80 CRI, and then you left and went to a parking lot of 90 CRI, would you know the difference? No. Even I don't think I, I would a, either. If I was a car dealer, I wouldn't know the difference. So. <laughs> Which is terrible maybe, but... <laughs> Well, happy. actually, actually, those exact studies are underway at car dealers to find out since most people shop at night and look after hours is that there are studies going out there is is there an advantage to a 90 CRI area light for car dealerships. So that and then the security application are the two main ones for that that are that people are looking at at least. And from a fixture manufacturer standpoint, the bigger issue is it costs more for those LEDs generally, and there's a really long lead time to get them because True. most LED True. manufacturers aren't stocking a ton of 90 CRI, in, especially in the LED space that we work in for exterior. There's just not a ton of 90. It, if they have them, they can make them, but it, yes. it can take eight to 12 weeks to get those LEDs uh, to fulfill an order for 90 CRI. You know, yeah. My people. thought, yeah. My thought is too is that that CRI is such a condensed, easy number to use that it's often reached for as a silver bullet to be a facsimile for good lighting design. And so people can think, well, if I've got 90 CRI and I can do good color rendering, therefore my parking lot is safe, whereas they've skipped right over max dimension uniformities or vertical illuminance. And I think doing the groundwork and the diligence to make sure that your lighting approach from the very beginning has good safety standards you uh, can be enhanced by CRI, but it's not the crux upon which your entire lighting schematic should be developed. Agreed, <laughs> 100%. All right. Well, we've, uh, we've run out of time for this morning. I do wanna let everybody know that's on here right now that we actually have about uh, 10 more questions that we didn't get to that we're actually going to uh, launch into those at two o'clock. So the two o'clock webinar is not going to be necessarily just a repeat of this. So we might talk about some of the same stuff, but there's going to be a lot more questions uh, being asked. So it may be well worth your time to drop in at two o'clock or at least tell your, uh, tell your coworkers that, um, you know, there's more to be learned. Um, the, uh, Someone did comment on the chat section that uh, they enjoyed the webinar and thinks that this should be a once a month uh, webinar. Are you guys in for once a month? If you guys, we did this? Sure, yeah, I can make time, time, no problem. Yeah. Okay, all right, well, maybe we do that. So uh, um, other than that, I, I just, I wanna like thank everybody for participating. I wanna thank the attendees for, for joining us and uh, we'll, we'll be back at two o'clock if, uh, if you guys wanna join us again. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks.